Our um, main talk today is going to be presented by uh, Christopher Gabler, who is a research professor at the University of Houston. Um, I had a f fairly substantial bio, and I decided not to read it. I'm just going to summarize it for you. He's done a lot of really cool stuff. Um, <clears throat> graduate of Rice University. Um, he said he just got back from 10 days of field work in the Everglades. Um, a, a, some of his, a lot of his work involves uh, conservation in coastal wetland areas. Um, I met him when I was doing a, a little talk over at the Thoreau Unitarian Fellowship, and um, sounded like he'd be a really good speaker. So we're really grateful. And, and then those are his lovely children over there. Uh, that's his, his wife, Jen, and uh, daughter, Evelyn, and son, Alexander, are with us today. So we're glad to have you. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to Houston Oasis to Christopher Gabler. How about now? Great. All right. Thank you, Mike, very much for the introduction and the invitation. Um, it's not every day that I get to talk about evolution. I'm on the ecology side of things, as I'll talk a little bit about. Um, one reason I bring my family is because they always make so much noise for me. It really <laughs> make me feel welcome, yeah. And, and when other people start crying, they drown it out. It doesn't seem like anything unusual when I'm talking. Um, but uh, it's really nice to be able to talk. I give a lot of talks, and it's always about ecology. And so it's nice to be able to talk about evolution in conceptual terms, which is not something I get, usually get to do, and I really am looking forward to being able to do it. So thank you again very much for the, evolu uh, for the introduction, and it's how fantastic to be able to do it on Pagan Christmas of all days. Okay. Oops, this is turned off. For now. Okay, so I apologize for the small text. This being the first time I've ever given this talk, it's... Uh, hasn't been whittled away yet. So, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm actually an ecologist, and <clears throat> ecologists study the interaction of organisms and their environment. And when we think about environment, we think about that in very broad terms. We think about the living and the non-living parts of what make up the environment. So living things are your neighbors, the things that eat you, the things you eat, um, and the it, unliving parts of it are things like whether you live on land or in water, what kind of soil is there, is, how hot is it, how, how much rain do you get, all of those things are influence the ecology of an organism. And I bring this up now because it's important in framing and contextualizing evolution. Um, they're sister disciplines. My degree is in ecology and evolutionary biology. And the two are always studied together because they are intrinsically linked. Um, evolution makes much more sense when you look at it in the context of ecology, and ecology makes much more sense when you look at it in a context of evolution. <clears throat> oh, that's great, thank you. Um, so, just because I'm actually a ecologist, don't think that I'm out, out of my depths. My degree, like I said, is in evolutionary biology as well. And actually, my most highly cited paper is actually a paper on the evolution of invasive species. So, uh, this, is, this is my forte. Um, so, it helps to think about ecology as being looking outside of the organisms. So we want to think about what, where does something live, well, what does it eat, what, is it, uh, what eats it, and this helps us explain how evolution unfolds and why it does that way. Um, I already talked about this a lot, but to give you a little analogy, one idea is to think of it in the grand story of life. Ecology is more the setting, okay? It's, it's the circumstances and the situations in which an organism finds itself, whereas evolution is more the characters and their motives and, and both of them explain why things change the way they do. Okay, so, um, turns out there are a lot of misconceptions about evolution out there, and I can't imagine why. It's not like there's misinformation being given left, right, and center every day after day after day. So, um, uh, briefly, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a primer on, on evolutionary biology, because this is, a, this is hardcore, real evolutionary biology I'm going to be giving to you. Um, and I've found that even really well-educated proponents of evolution often make fundamental mistakes about, about the nuances of how evolution works. And it can be complicated, so that's very understandable. And I've also found that the opponents of evolution, very often their talking points and the things that they use to oppose it the most, come from seemingly logical contradictions of what are actually no part of evolutionary theory. And, and I... I'll start with one thing that they often say, which is evolution is just a theory. Well, that they means something very different in the sciences. For something to become a theory in the sciences, it means it's gone through rigorous testing. 
It's got, you have tons of observations, experimental evidence to support your cause, and scientists whose job is to argue with one another and try to disprove your, your rival scientists you're fighting with over money. You try and prove your other uh, peers wrong, so to speak. You test what they've done, and it only becomes a theory when that's happened for decades and everyone really agrees on things. And that's a remarkable thing to happen. So when people think of, oh, it's a theory, it's, it's something, it's like a guess, that's a hypothesis. So if you wonder, well, what happened to my Christmas cookies? I think the dog ate them. That's a, that's a hypothesis, okay? That's, that's not a theory. Uh, and you don't hear people complaining about the theory of gravity. And this is kind of cliche, but no one's jumping out of windows because they think gravity is a theory. And same thing with atomic theory. And it's actually kind of interesting because uh, atomic theory and the theory of gravity have actually much more evidence against them than does evolutionary theory. Uh, in terms of gravity, Newton really only works on the scale of you and I. When you get into the cosmos, that's all special relativity. And when you go subatomic, that's all quantum mechanics. Okay? That's where you really start to get things right. And in terms of atomic theory, it turns out things aren't just made of atoms. They're also made of protons and neutrons. And, and electrons, and the protons and neutrons, quarks and gluons. There's all sorts of crazy stuff going on in there. So, pardon the review and my digression on what is a theory. Um, and don't feel bad if you've made these mistakes, because it's, this is, a lot of this is actually like really advanced evolutionary stuff, so don't worry about it. Um, it's only, there's no shame in ignorance, but there should be shame in willful ignorance. If you're putting your fingers in your ears and burying your head in the sand, that's not so good. Okay. He likes to help me during my talks. Um, the first big misconception is that, is that humans evolved from chimps or apes or monkeys. We did not. That is not part of evolutionary theory. If anything, we have evolved with them over time. What we do have is a relatively recent common ancestor. So this is an example of a phylogenetic tree that shows the relatedness of organisms to one another. When they come off of a branch, so let's say we have a human here and a chimpanzee here, you can follow up the lineage and where they meet is their most recent common ancestor, hominini, about five million years ago. So that's our most recent common ancestor, five million years ago. That's not very recent, but in the grand scheme of things, it very much is. I don't need to pick you up. You want to touch that? You want to point at the monkey? Can you point at the orangutan? I'm going to assume you're right. Very good. Okay. Not right now, big guy. Okay, so if we look back, we see that above this most recent common ancestor, a little bit farther back than that, we had a recent common ancestor with gorillas. That's, and so when we talk about how our closest ancestors are, that's what that means. It means our, our most recent common ancestor was relatively close. You go farther back, it's been a long time since we had a recent common ancestor with, with other monkeys like New World, New World monkeys. That's, that's much farther in the past. Okay, and then this is just a zoom in of what's happening here. This is human evolution in the last two million years. Anyway, enough of that. Another misconception is that evolution and natural selection and Darwinism are the same thing, and they're used interchangeably, especially by people um, who oppose the ideas. And they are not at all the same things. Evolution it has a very specific biological definition, and it's the change in gene frequency within a population over time. That's all. That's all it is. It's, it's a pretty simple concept that has very profound implications. Individuals do not evolve, ever. Okay? You can, you can be Spider-Man. You still didn't evolve. If, you're, if your genes change and you get superpowers, you're still not evolving. That's an environmental uh, manipulation. Okay? Humans are absolutely evolving. Okay? People think, oh, humans aren't, haven't been evolving for a long time. Absolutely are. We are still changing. Gene frequencies are changing. Uh, <clears throat> it's just that we have very different selective pressures than a few hundred thousand years ago when we were avoiding predators on foot, okay? And it's usually slow, but it can be quite fast. Uh, you might notice that we need different flu shots every year, and that's because viruses evolve pretty quickly. Uh, it depends on what the selective pressure is. Darwinism, on the other hand, is the idea of natural selection plus a bunch of other stuff, some of which has been disproven. Darwin lived a long time ago, he was coming up with this theory of evolution, or he did come up with it, well before we knew anything about chromosomes. He preceded Mendel, and that's really incredible. 
if you think about, if you know anything about these two guys, that he was able to come up with such an excellent explanation without knowing basic genetics. So the modern synthesis is very different. And here's some explanations for how things work. If you guys have ever done a Punnett square in a biology class, I don't need to go on to the nuances here, but we have, uh, humans are diploid, we have two sets of, of chromosomes, and how things get, there's independent assortments, so chromosomes go in, it's, that's, I take my word for it, that uh, it works in a very scientific way and we understand it well now. Okay, natural selection is extremely important. It is, it is the mechanism, one of the mechanisms of evolution, one of the mechanisms that drives change. And it gets the most play because it's the adaptive one. And it's the one that can have some of the most profound uh, implications the quickest. But there are, other mu uh, there are other mechanisms. One is mutation. Things just change at random. <clears throat> but that doesn't usually, it's usually not good. It usually kills things or makes no difference because of uh, the, the redundancy in the genetic code. Migration affects uh, gene frequency. So if, if someone from another population, let's say another country, comes to a different population and breeds with someone who's there, that's new genes coming in. Gene frequencies are changing. And you're telling me that doesn't happen. That people migrate all over the place. Humans are evolving. My, it's happening. Genetic drift is also random. This is a kind of, uh, this is, has to do with boring stuff that's not really relevant here. So, in order for natural selection to happen, there are four requirements. First, there has to be variation in traits. It's really a quite simple process. Let's imagine we have beetles. Some are green, some are brown, some are big, and some are little. Pretty straightforward. Variability in a population. I look around, I don't see people that look identical. We're different heights, we're different colors, we're different genders, okay? There's variation in the population. And then, let's say the green bug is getting nailed by birds all the time. It's, it's not as good at hiding, so it gets eaten more often. That means that there aren't as many around to reproduce, which means there's differential reproduction. So just by virtue of surviving longer, more reproduction in the brown beetles means if the color brown is hereditary, in the next generation, there are going to be more brown beetles because they're the ones that are reproducing. If this is really an adaptive trait over time, the advantageous things are going to become more and more common, and eventually, unless the selective pressure changes, it's going to become fixed. So over time, you start with this variation that's heritable, one form gives you an advantage, and eventually, everything has it. That's been a phenotypic shift, you know, a visible outside shift, that's happened by result of natural selection. Happens all the time, definitely happening. Has been demonstrated in laboratory and field conditions repeatedly. <clears throat> okay, this one is a little bit less intuitive. Evolution is also, is, is not just about becoming different. It's not about diverging necessarily. It's also about things becoming more similar. So if you look at the bone structure in the hands of a bunch of mammals, we have, these are the arms of a human, a horse, you know, humans built for grasping and manipulating, horses built for running, cats built for running and manipulating, a bat for flying, a bird for flying, very different though, and a whale it's for swimming, okay? These are homologous structures. It's the same bones that have shaped differently over evolutionary time. And these, that's called divergent evolution. On the other hand, you have convergent evolution. And that's when things from different lineages actually start to take on a shape that has the same function but they're from different sources. So we have a butterfly wing and a pterodactyl wing and a bird wing and a bat wing. These are analogous structures. Okay, they evolved independently. Okay, they didn't come from the same ancestor. These developed independently along different lineages of organisms. And something else we notice is that there tends to be a convergence of life forms. These are all placental mammals you'd find in North America or Africa, and these are all the really kooky Australian counterparts. Okay, so there tends to be a convergence of life forms within the ecological role, within the niche. So if you're something that knocks over ant mounds and eats ants, it turns out that the, wherever you grew up or wherever you developed and evolved, you kind of take on a similar form. Same thing if you're a gliding tree climber or a predator of a lot of things based on agility or a predator based on speed and endurance. So things can also get more similar. All right, so on to the main matter here. Not a moment too soon. I'm talking about the golden rule and how something like this could have possibly evolved. Seems like such a human thing, at least to some of us. So the golden rule, you've probably heard it, there, there are a lot of variations of it, but basically do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And it's, got, and it's this basic process. 
You want some nice things, so you should do nice things. Hopefully, those nice things are going to get noticed by the people around you. And they, hopefully, in turn, are going to do nice things to you as well, and you'll benefit from that. So, and you have a benefit, so why not have more? And it's a normal, natural cycle. It makes sense. Um, the idea of giving a little to get some back makes perfect sense. And this is something that happens and exists all throughout nature. And it's something called reciprocal altruism. Okay? And this being a very scientific term, we've given it a very scientific definition. But it basically is the golden rule. In order for something to be considered reciprocal altru altruism, it, first, it has to reduce the donor's fitness, the person doing the action. It has to cost you something. It also has to increase the fitness of the person you're doing it to, or the organism you're doing it to. So it has to actually help someone else. You know, you, you have to give them food. You can't, you know, decorate their tree. Maybe that doesn't actually increase their fitness. It also has to be done without a guarantee of a reward. It's not an exchange. Okay, that's different. This isn't bartering. This isn't I'll protect you if you feed me. This is, I'm going to protect you. And if something good happens as a result down the line, or you help me out when I need protection, great. But I'm not going to withhold that help until it happens. I'll do it initially. And these have to be both, go both ways. So both of the actors have to be able to exchange favors, and uh, it has to happen enough times for this to actually evolve. So this is what makes it reciprocal altruism, and then for it to become, for it to be able to evolve, a few other things have to happen. One of which I just mentioned, it has to happen enough times. If it's extremely rare that this ever happens, it's probably not going to evolve, because you can't get a regular behavior based on it. <clears throat> and another important thing that's gonna come up later on and is extremely useful to this discussion is the idea that you have to be able to detect when someone is cheating. Okay, and I'll mention that more later. That's a very important point. Okay, so let's think about reciprocal altruism, the golden rule. They both assume a group lifestyle. Uh, they both assume that your behavior affects the group, and then that your group's performance affects you, which it does. It makes a lot of sense for any social organism. And you need to be able to expect group judgment, that how you behave is going to shape the behavior directed back at you because the others are going to notice what you're doing and, be, and respond accordingly. And usually what you expect is tit for tat. You expect that uh, this ethic of recipro reciprocity is going to take place. You're going to get what you give, okay? So it, it makes sense to give good things. And you don't, in both cases, you don't expect a reward necessarily, uh, although you can expect social capital. You can expect to have prestige rate, uh, your prestige raised if other individuals see you giving and not necessarily taking. So because you don't exchange, you just hope that it comes back to you, they both teach an important thing, which is that you should be the one to make the first sacrifice. You should reach out. You should take the first step. And that's a good lesson, and that's something that has evolved throughout a lot of lineages, and I'll give you some examples in just a moment. But it's interesting to note that in this is happening, this, this unselfish behavior can evolve from purely selfish motives. And the differences between the two are not very big, and it tends to have to do with the negative side of this. First is that the golden rule kind of implies the negative exchange as well. So do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Well, if you expect them to be a jerk, you can be a jerk to them. Or if you expect them to not help you at all, why help anybody? I've heard people use that golden rule as an excuse for their, for their uh, lack of, that is dusty, yeah, for their lack of generosity or their otherwise uh, malignant behavior. Whereas reciprocal altruism is much more about just exploiting the system. It's much more about cheating. There's not this, there are things like punishment and retribution, but that's not really part of reciprocal altruism. You either participate and give, or you just try to take. Okay, so here's some really good examples. One of the most uh, celebrated and best known is our cleaning symbioses. So cleaner animals are things like fish and shrimp and birds, and they go and eat ectoparasites like ticks off of bigger creatures, like bigger fish or turtles or mammals. And this is more than just a simple symbiosis. So there are a lot of cases where two animals interact and they both benefit. That's a mutualism. That's a positive symbiosis. But there's more to it than that, because cleaners have the opportunity to cheat. While they're cleaning parasites off, they could also take a bite out of their host, but they don't do it at least typically not. 
Hosts also give them free entrance, often to very sensitive places. You'll have a bird pecking right at an eye or something like that. Uh, and not only that, but when they're done being cleaned, they'll give a signal and say, okay, I'm done, you know, let's, I'm going to slowly shut my mouth, get out of the way, and they don't eat the cleaners because it makes a lot of sense. Once that bird cleans your teeth, you get a bird to eat, but the alligator doesn't do it. So part of the reasons this happens is because we've observed that this happens repeatedly, even among the very same individuals. That bird is going to meet that alligator again, and even if that bird gets eaten, its friends know it was eaten by an alligator, and they won't clean the alligator next time. So there are systems of punishment, and this is really important. So when cheaters cheat, they get punished, and so that's a big part of how this evolves. Cheaters are detected, and they're dealt with. Signaling behavior is another really good and common example. Um, this is where one member of a group warns the others that there's a threat coming. Pretty simple. You're a bird and you chirp because a cat's coming and you warn your bird friends. And that doesn't seem like a big sacrifice, but you're signaling your presence. You're kind of standing up and shouting. So you're making yourself be more at danger. And this is really common among birds, but it's also done by mammals and fish, like white-tailed deer. That's a really good example. Um, so I mentioned the calling birds. White-tailed de deer will flail their tails to show the others in the herd that there's a wolf or something present. And chemical cues are also really common, especially in aquatic environments where you're smelling and tasting the water. It's actually called Schreckstoff, which is German for bad stuff. And they basically spray chemicals into the water saying, I just got bitten by something. You guys need to get out of here. And, and they've evolved to identify that really carefully and really, uh, really efficiently. So um, there's a bit of debate over whether how well this fits the reciprocal altruism model because it's really difficult to detect cheaters. You'd have to be able to watch and know that some birds never call but still fly away when they hear calls. So there's some debate, but, but the general consensus is that this is absolutely another good example of reciprocal altruism. Nest protecting. Birds and fish especially do this. And this is where you are in your nest, your neighbor is out collecting food, and something comes up to take an egg, but you attack it anyway. You're helping your neighbor out. It's the neighborly thing to do. You protect another's nest um, just because. Uh, because and potentially you're going to have the action reciprocated when you're out hunting for food and a predator comes to your nest. Uh, Red-winged blackbirds are really known for this. They're quite aggressive, uh, not just to their own nests. Mockingbirds, super aggressive of their own nests, not so aggressive of their neighbor's nests. And this is definitely more than just kin selection. I'm going to talk about kin selection, which is another thing that can drive altruism in just a moment. <clears throat> they do this whether or not neighbors are related to them, which is one reason it's not kin selection. And they also punish. They do less defending if their neighbors don't ever defend their nest when they're gone. Okay, so there's, again, that system of punishment. Group parenting is one you might have seen about or read about or, or noticed if you keep dogs. Adults, even those without young and those unrelated to the pack, um, will take turns caring for the young in their group. And this is really common among mammals, also in birds. Birds do a lot of fun stuff. Uh, and it's, it's actually particularly common in predators, especially ones that have social groups like packs. So lions and wolves are really good examples. Um, and this is different than when parenting is shared among relatives, which is, which is way more common. But then it could just be an example of kin selection rather than reciprocal altruism. Okay, grooming in primates is the last example I'm going to give you. Um, this has been really, really well documented and not surprising, and it's the most like human uh, reciprocal altruism. In this case, the monkeys and the primates that groom one another, or, that, or rather, sorry, the ones that get groomed, are much more likely to assist either by grooming or by sharing food, and even by defending from attackers the ones that groomed them. And they're less likely to do so for the ones that don't groom them. So again, it's just, it's a, there's an ethic of reciprocity. Um, and so this has been really well documented, especially in crab-eating macaques and vervet monkeys. So a good system. Uh, in the interest of time, as interesting as this is, I'm going to skip this bit about um, another method that can drive kin selection, uh, another method, sorry, that can drive altruism, which is kin selection, and the eusocial insects. Um, if anyone wants to ask me a question about this, I'd love to come back and tell you about when some individuals completely give up their ability to reproduce. And you're selected based on your 
your, the fitness of your sisters rather than your own fitness. Okay, this brings us to reciprocal altruism in humans. We're, not surprisingly, quite a bit more complicated than the animal models we've looked at already, and this is because our system is pretty sensitive and unstable. We've been shaped by reciprocal altruism, as well as kin selection, as well as group selection, and a lot of other evolutionary phenomena. I, talked, I have high praise for birds. I'm not surprised that bird is happy about my, my, <laughs> what I'm saying. <clears throat> so I'm going to, I don't usually do quotes, but this is, um, being an ecologist, there's some really great evolutionary thought here. And so Trivers, who literally wrote the, the book and the paper on the evolution of reciprocal altruism, explains that each individual human is seen as possessing altruistic and cheating tendencies, the expression of which is sensitive to developmental variables that were selected to set the tendencies at a balance appropriate to their local, social, and ecological environment. So to oversimplify this, we have impulses to both cheat and to help, and how much we do of both of those depends on uh, what's socially acceptable and what we've needed to do to survive. And that makes perfect sense. And you can, we have a lot more sympathy for someone who had a hard life and might be stealing because they're hungry versus someone who does it for no apparent reason or just out of greed. And we have a very complex social and psychological system for regulating this altruistic behavior. I'll skip the quote again, and again, just oversimplify what's already been said, to say basically, the way this happens is that we learn to trust cooperators and to distrust cheaters. And then we actually have evolved and developed these really complicated emotional responses that in happen instantly, or without us even thinking about it, just instinctively, uh, that motivate our future interactions with these cheaters or trusted cooperators. And so, as complicated as it is, reciprocal altruism is still promoted and celebrated throughout human cultures, as we can see by this great example of the many golden rules that exist throughout world religions. Here are just 13 of the most commonly known ones. The golden rule is not strictly Christian, and as I've hopefully shown you, it's not strictly human. Uh, so these are some of the big world religions that have perfect examples. Um, I can't really read them, but they basically all say the same thing. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Don't impose your will on someone if it's not something you'd imp want imposed on yourself, etc., etc. And they're all often presented as the rule of rules, the summary of, of what's most important among the rules. And if we look at how this happened, and this, so the stars here, this is an evolutionary table of world religions. So this is a lot of fun. This is, this is a very similar to the evolutionary table, and I use that term loosely because it's not the idea that languages and ideas are selected memes, that sort of thing. Very much an evolutionary basis, but different because it's not by genes. But anyway, it follows the language evolution very closely, and that makes a lot of sense because if you're exchanging ideas and words, about how you say things and express things, you're gonna be exchanging ideas about gods and deities and why the sun comes up the way it does and why the moon changes and why the tides rise. So evolution of religion very much follows evolution of language. And the ones that are starred are the ones that I just showed you on the previous slide that had really clear, without a doubt, good examples of a golden rule that expresses the ethic of reciprocity. But there are way more on here than just the ones with stars. I could star almost every single one of these as an example of a religion that has a golden rule. So this comes down to punishment. Maybe you're thinking, well, why not cheat? We talked a little bit about cheating, but that makes so much good sense, especially in human society where it's such a big group with people you don't often see again. Uh, what would stop us, or wouldn't this stop reciprocal altruism from evolving? and uh, stop, or, or, or it just either wouldn't evolve or wouldn't happen or wouldn't work. Punishment is the answer to this. Punishment is what reinforces reciprocal altruism both across species and within groups, within individual groups. And it's especially important in sizable groups. So to give you an example of punishment, we talked about cleaner wrasses before. Those are the fish that eat the food out of other fish's mouths, or sorry, that eat the parasites out of other fish. Um, so that, again, they can bite the clients, but they don't because they're punished. Males and females often work in pairs. And if you're working in pairs, the motive is going to be, be the first one to take a bite, because once you take a bite, the, the host is going to swim away. But they don't do that because they'll punish one another for being the cheater. Um, 
So punishment becomes even more important as group size increases. And this is especially the case in human societies because there's a lot of social factors in terms of how we respond to one another, how we interact with one another. Um, and so, again, I'm going to skip this long quote and just say that consistent punishment is really what provides the impetus for, uh, for positive reciprocity in large human populations. And the reason for this is because most of the people we meet we're not related to. Our groups are very, very large. And we, like I was saying before, we don't see people as often as other organisms do when they live in a small group, especially in a big city. So having a really well-established system of punishment is essential for reciprocal altruism to evolve and continue to be practiced. So then the big question becomes, what behaviors merit punishment? And the answer is the Ten Commandments, or their local equivalent. Um, that's unfortunate, this is unreadable, but that's your list of the Ten Commandments. Um, here, this is, it's the Talmudic version, the, the Augustinian version. The numbering varies depending on what tradition you want. This is all on Wikipedia, that's what that says. Wik, go, you know, Google Ten Commandments, it comes up. And if we look at these commandments, and we break them down, and we think about it in terms of reciprocal altruism, it's actually a really, really easy interpretation and straightforward. The ones about, I am the Lord your God, have no other gods besides me, you know, no false idols. Basically, those are all saying that some rules are really sacred. These are those rules. These are the sacred ones. Keep holy the Sabbath day. That's the idea of, you should think about these rules. Honor your father and mother. You should respect those that enforce the rules. And then everything else. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Don't covet. Don't lie. Those are all really specific rules that are prohibiting things. And what are they prohibiting? They're prohibiting the behaviors that reduce social order and reduce group fitness, and they're prohibiting ways you can cheat. So the golden rule is a codification of what we should be punished for, or the Ten Commandments are, rather. The Ten Commandments is a codification of what we should be punished for, and the golden rule is simply a very an attempt at being a very elegant summary of those rules. But it really is just merely um, our culture's expression, and every culture has one, of how reciprocal altruism that we evolved to perform should actually be enacted. So I'm going to end with that and say, hopefully, in, uh, as you are celebrating your holiday season, let's concentrate on being better altruists and not so much on punishment. So. Thank you all very much. Here's some further reading. Thank you. Yeah.